Uh, good morning slash afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us here for another IHA webinar. Our speaker today is Tom Moraboli. Tom is the principal and founder of Springboard Insights. Um, and he is also serves as the global consumer trend forecaster for the International Housewares Association as is a contributing editor for Pantone. Tom's emphasis on consumer centric product development and generational relevance has guided the evolution and creative direction of some of the most well respected brands and retailers in the home and housewares industry. Created custom intelligence and insight reports for folks such as Walmart, Target, Amazon, Meyer, Kroger, and Walgreens, as well as others. Uh, my name is Liana Salama. I'm the Vice President of Marketing for the International Housewares Association. Um, and I am very excited to have Tom here today presenting a session that he put together for us originally for the Inspired Home Show. Um, and that now we are going to bring to you virtually uh, via the session today. Hi, Tom. Hi, how are you? Um, and thank you so much for having me. Um, and thank you everybody for joining. I know that uh, you, you're probably reaching that point in your, uh, in, in your, well, in your quarter where you're like webinar it out. Uh, but, and we try to keep that in mind when Leanna and I work on something, uh, you know, we really try to bring something to the table that's, that's usable. You know, our, we, we like to keep things actionable and we really felt like this was important. I think we've all seen a lot of, you know, post COVID, pre COVID, you know, uh, will there ever be a post COVID type of things? And, and certainly um, the pandemic we've taken into consideration, uh, into very serious consideration, what we're about to show you. However, the focus, <clears throat> pardon me, is not so much on that, but really on how to, um, how to satisfy consumers, what they're going to be expecting when they get back to shopping again uh, and shopping hopefully at full speed. So um, let me just share my screen with you and I'm going to sort of talk about that. Originally, this was originally created <clears throat> as a piece that was going to address um, independence. Uh, independent retailers and and not so much you know what, what the really large retailers, but as we see the way the pandemic is affecting, <clears throat> pardon me, consumers. One of the things that we're hearing from all uh, all varieties of uh, consumer forecast trend forecasters and analysts is that consumers want to be treated like human beings, like individuals. This has made people very very um, sensitive to being treated humanely uh, with humanity with empathy. And uh, so because of that, uh, we really are getting a lot of calls about, you know, how do even the big guys, how do we, you know, uh, sort of act in a way that is uh, genuine. And, and uh, so I think this is really interesting because of that. Um, so so one note that. here is Tom shares his screen. Um, there's a Q&A button if you mouse over the Zoom window. <laughs> you click on that Q&A button, you can go ahead and submit questions throughout the duration of the presentation. And then once the presentation is over, um, I will come back on uh, to kind of facilitate the Q&A portion of it with Tom. Also, just so you know, <clears throat> pardon me, I'm sorry. Just so you know, you will be, um, uh, you will get this presentation in its entirety. Actually, we've truncated it a bit. You're gonna get a longer version of it. Um, and all of the data that you're gonna hear about is shown in full in the presentation. So feel free to relax and have a drink and enjoy the sunshine if you want to while you watch. Um, so the faster formula um, is we've created uh, a really uh, for success and a way to move forward past all of this. Um, and what we always like to start um, any presentation with is a single sheet that sort of looks at the generations, gets everybody on the same page about who the generations are, what, um, <clears throat> pardon me, what their uh, ownership is and, you know, uh, how they, what, what part of our business they should be, we should be concentrating on when we, when we think about consumers and customers. Um, so first we'll look at millennials, 25% of the population. They're about 31% of average household spending, 37% of them own a home and 63% rent a home. They're really defined by technology more than anything else, sorry. Um, and um, the, you know, when we think of, I'm trying to get rid of this so I can show you, uh, when we think of millennials, we really, Think, say that they're known for urbanism. They, they really um, have brought life back into the cities. They love urban living. When we look at the next generation, sorry, Gen X. So 12% of the population, 25% of average household spending, 59% of them own a home and 41% rent. They were really defined by the last recession, which was in 2008. Um, and they're known for balance. They, they are the first generation that really made work-life balance happen. 
because they saw a lot of their savings go, uh, go away temporarily or permanently uh, in the last recession. They said, you know what, we're working so hard and we're, we're sacrificing relationships. That has seeped into every other generation's sensibility. So it's important to realize that. When we look at boomers, 82 million of them, they're between 54 and 74 years old. 23% of the population, 36% of average household spending, 72% of them own a home. So they're very important um, in terms of they have a very stable environment and also their debt load is relatively low and 28% rent a home. We are seeing this generation move back to renting because they want to do less of the sort of taking care of things, less mowing the lawn. They want more of a, to experience more of their life and to do less of the work. Um, so time savings is very important to them. They're really defined by affluence um, and they're really known for suburbanism and bringing the, the suburbs to life. And finally, seniors, 8% of the population, 8% of average household spending, about 79% of them own their home and 21% uh, rent. Uh, they're really defined by the first recession, earlier recession, and they are quite frugal. Um, a lot of their decision making in home products and uh, home and housewares and even gifting is um, <clears throat> really uh, reduced at this point, uh, at this stage, life stage, they're only spending about 4% of their income in our in home categories. A lot of those decisions, they defer to their kids, their boomer kids, and, and so influence there really is influencing seniors. And finally, Gen Z. Gen Z is really starting, they, you, as you can see, they don't, they don't really constitute a, a, a significant amount of household spending because of their age. They're 11 to 22. So but there are 50 million of them. There are gonna be a very large generation. They're 15% of the population and um, they are really defined by social media and they're known for mobility. Um, when we do talk about COVID, one of the things that we really can expect is Gen Z and millennials are going to be the hardest hit by this. Millennials in particular, because you have to realize that millennials, this is the second, um, this is the second financial sort of catastrophe that they've seen in their life. Uh, they saw 2008, they are just entering their peak earning years. They're gonna start at around 44, 45. So they're just entering their peak earning years. And here we go with you know, another sort of financial upheaval and even a social upheaval. So you're gonna see that, um, and also their debt load happens to be very high. They have the highest average uh, personal debt of any of the generations in terms of per capita $37,000 in debt when they come out of school. Um, on the positive side, that debt, a lot of people think is, um, college debt or educational debt, it's not. Only 17% of it is educational debt. This is a generation that loves experience. So if you can bring them experience through product, you're going to sell them and you're going to, you know, bring joy to their lives. And they're, you know, they're not about um, uh, really, they want experiences, they want things that they can share because they love sharing lifestyle. So it's very easy to talk about <clears throat> different generations and how they're all so very different. And yes, that's true, but really, there are certain things that unite all generations. Um, and I, we always, uh, if, I, if I were in person, I would be asking for you to raise your hands, but we ask ourselves, what are the driving needs and aspirations that matter to all consumers, regardless of generation? The answer is intangibles. What inspires and engages today's consumers most frequently isn't even visible. And I know that that sounds strange, but we're gonna go through some things, at, uh, through some of the, the things in this faster, um, uh, this faster philosophy, and you're gonna see what I'm talking about. <clears throat> when we look across the, <clears throat> pardon me, we see that a lot of them share certain behaviors, certain characteristics, and we believe that these create a roadmap. Uh, and so using those characteristics, we've created what we call a faster guide um, to relevance and business success. Each one of these letters represents a specific group of behaviors. So let's look at F first, flexible, fun, and fearless. And we're gonna give you examples of all of these and who's doing it really well. Um, a, be addictive, be aware, be aspirational, be surprising, be shareable, be simple, be true, be transparent, and be trustworthy. And finally, be real world, be responsible, and be reactive. So if we look at these one by one, <clears throat> pardon me, let's look at the first F. When we talk about being flexible, and I know that if there are a lot of um, small business owners or independents out there who look at something like this and say to be active across all of these channels is daunting and it's hard to, um, it's hard to realize on a, you know, on a, on a fixed budget. Um, just understand we're not here to, to deny reality. We're here to face reality. And the fact is that in a way that these connections have made 
competition easier because it's a low cost of entry. In, in other words, you could be you could be showing products on Instagram, on Etsy, on, on a lot of different sites that cost almost nothing. So the 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 question is how you identify that. Um, new business models. The, the today's Today's consumer is very open to different types of business models, things that they haven't heard before. Uh, Warby Parker, who's now moved to an almost no store uh, type of retail experience. Subscription retail like um, uh, BarkBox or things where you are subscribing to something that, you know, that you're not even sure what you're going to get. It's the element of surprise. But when we look at um, diverse expectations, the, the ability to customize products has also really improved the small business and independent business of business ability to meet new consumer needs. Um, the, we're very empowered via data. So there's a lot more data that you can gather to tell you who your customers are and also co-producers of product. PD is interactive. Um, Jules, can you bring me the questions about that? Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to give you an example of a couple of companies who are really, really flexible. Um, <clears throat> one of them is IKEA. IKEA is working with Adidas to craft an easier way to work out at home. So it's not their core understanding, but they're reaching out to talk to other businesses. This can happen regardless of this side. Size so like Per Se uh, has created a really great fun Star Wars collection. Um, and then uh, the idea of this idea of change is constant. So when you build a company, you have to build in structural flexibility. You have to build in uh, a balanced assortment. And you know, really have to plan for change. Okay, I got a new plug, so I think. Oh yeah, we're good. Okay, got it. <laughs> and um, we're moving from reactive to progressive, meaning that <clears throat> we're not just reacting to what other retailers are doing. The important thing is to have a unique perspective and to apply it inside of the environment that you're in. A great example of this is, um, and a friend of mine, Susan Yashinsky from Sphere Trending, uses a phrase called neighborhoods of solutions and the importance of creating that at retail. And she's absolutely right. Um, but we also have to create that at wholesale. Um, so Barcraft is a great example <clears throat> where they started out as a bar tool company, but then they moved into the whole lifestyle of cocktail entertaining. So they, they went into the experience and they said, well, yes, we can make bar tools and we can make cocktail shakers. But we need to approach the category the way the consumer approaches the category, which is broad and really lifestyle. Be fun. Um, so I put links to all of these. I won't play them for you now, but if you haven't seen them, they are hysterical. Um, these are some of Forbes um, top 10 uh, um, commercials from the last Super Bowl. And they, they speak to something very important, which is when a company speaks it with a sense of humor, Two things, two things happen. First, we realize that they're confident enough in what they do every day to speak to us with a sense of humor in their areas, you know, in areas that don't have expertise and also just the need to be human. So that idea of appearing human and being fun. Also being fun, a couple of great examples of, of retail uh, and, and uh, leisure, sort of retail as um, enrichment. Uh, you know, uh, if we look at uh, I don't know if any of you have gotten to see Showfields here in New York, an amazing space. And again, you can click through to an article and some examples and their site as well. Also, Camp uh, in New York is a, Camp is an experience that is a, um, it's, it's a kid's experience, but you walk in and it's like walking into a different world. And yes, product is available, but that's not the focus. The focus is really experience. Be fearless. So, a lot of companies have chosen to focus on a very specific point of view. Um, when you look at uh, the new uh, foldable screen, so the Samsung Gallery uh, foldable screen, it's a, um, a mid-size that you can, bigger than a regular foam, but smaller than a tablet, and you can fold it and put it in your pocket. Um, people like uh, Michelob, who basically decided that they were gonna take a stand and promote organic farming. And also um, this um, uh, Wonderman Thompson, uh, it reported on a new convenience store where it's really just curating interesting things, constantly changing the assortment. So the idea of not of being fearless about your vision, because your vision is what separates you from everyone else. When we look at A, be addictive, be aware, and be aspirational. So really, 
Um, consumers are incredibly distracted. The average adult now spends about six hours a day on digital media, and that's up almost double from 2009. And the average reader gives only 15 seconds of their attention to an article. We can expect that the same is going to happen at, at, the, at the digital experience if you have one for your brand, but also the experience that people have in store. So this idea of constantly recreating, giving people a chance on, if you look at a story, and uh, you can find them on thisisstory.com. Story was a um, small shop that created a different story every, about every month. Um, so it was story was home for the holidays or love story or color story. And they filled up their store with all products that were completely new from their last assortment. They would shut down for a week. Um, now you see Birchbox teaming up with Walgreens on the left to create a unique uh, cosmetic experience. But this idea of bringing people back for a fresh experience every time is also something that people are getting much better at. In fact, uh, Macy's bought up Story uh, as a brand, and now um, they're, uh, they're in select uh, A stores for Macy's. Um, the, the, also, the idea of how much time we spend and what our, what's happened to our attention span. So we know human attention span is dwindling. Sadly, in 2000, we had an average attention span of 12 seconds. Now we're down to nine seconds, which is approximately the attention span of a goldfish. Um, we, we have to deal with that. It's not a pleasant reality, but we have to learn to communicate inside of, inside of that. And it's not just online, it's also in store. It's walking by things, grabbing somebody's attention, making the experience that they can imagine um, fresh. And also being addictive means bringing people fresh all the time. Uh, I put in a chart here and the data is also attached. So you can see where people spend their media time by age group down the bottom and uh, by uh, time spent in minutes uh, up the left axis. We also think it's very important to be aware of what's going on uh, culturally. And, and that just means being a culture vulture because you know, no matter what business you are, it may be the uh, you know, particular events like Coachella or what's the hot retail right now, who are the hot fashion designers. We live in a very homogenized world of style. So many people who are interested in fashion, it doesn't matter to them whether they expect to see the same patterns on uh, bedding that they see on ready to wear at H&M or um, you know, any other retailer. So it's important to keep an eye on the whole landscape of product. Um, you know, we also, keeping an eye on people's sensitivities. So for example, uh, at retail, there is a package free in New York City is a store that has absolutely no packaging. Uh, Marie Kondo has, uh, you probably all heard about her sense of organization. She's a little bit kooky, but amazing. Um, and uh, she has really changed the organization industry. It also food, what are people doing in food? Because that category affects everything. The bar, the, you know, at home bar master, <laughs> that whole thing started about four years before uh, and it's, it's, if you look online for it, you can actually see it happening. Um, these, uh, I haven't separated these really well, I apologize. But um, the other part of being aware is being aware of when you're being insensitive. And there, you know, I mean, there are people who have been just crazy, crazy, just decimated by press for being uh, racist or uh, sexist. Uh, you know, Peloton's holiday advert. Uh, you know, uh, sparked uh, a lot of sexist controversy, which you probably heard of. Bloomingdale's uh, holiday ad, it was supposed to be quirky and funny, but it ended up being kind of creepy. Spike your best friend's eggnog when they're not looking. Um, and then you have this whole, um, uh, you know, this uh, product issue on the left uh, that was considered racist and they had to pull all of it. You know, but it's just being careful. You, it's making sure that you're being inclusive. And when we look at some of the amazing inclusive marketing that's going on out there, you can see, you know, there's some examples of it, of it right here, but 77% of Gen Xers feel more positive towards a brand when it promotes gender equality on social media and advertising. Be aspirational. Um, this is important. And if you haven't seen it yet, there's a really amazing article that I mentioned once in a while um, from Adobe uh, called The Flexible Self. Um, and the idea behind it is that we don't think, we don't dream of owning things now so much as we dream of becoming someone. So the idea is to stop telling people just who we are and start telling them that we know who they are and that we can help them reach the, um, the per person that they aspire to be, the skills that they want to, um, uh, they want to um, 
hone, uh, you know, but the idea is that great brands help people become their best selves and give them ideas about the people that they want to become. Um, KitchenAid, great example. Um, you can play the video here, but they, uh, for their 100th anniversary, they put out a group of um, uh, short videos that just basically paid homage to the makers um, because the makers and the bakers and all these people who cook uh, and use their products. And it was, it was an important message to send because prior to that, a lot of people tend to think of, of um, KitchenAid as a slightly older brand um, and a little bit more traditional. So when we take on the S, be surprising, be shareable, and be simple. Hmm. Again, just some great examples of people who have really created the excitement of discovery. And some of them created through product or experience or service, um, stitch fix, uh, using data and technology to meet consumer needs. So you, you, they take your measurements, they, you know, they will set you a, send you a group of clothing, you send them back what you don't like, but they start to, they really hone in on who you are and what you like. Um, uh, we, we work has these new food labs where they are, are inside of WeWork. They're cultivating startups in the food industry locally. Um, and so there's a lot of different examples of people who are really creating exciting so excitement. And you got to ask yourself, how are you creating that? I love the idea of collaborating with diverse sets of companies. Um, here in Brooklyn, we're seeing a lot of businesses that are next to each other or even on the next block saying, okay, how can we work together to keep this all going or to make this exciting and make people come back? And there's a lot of interesting conversations happening about uh, combined businesses. Also, unexpected design, you know, uh, these, uh, you know, and, and uh, this Gourmia three-in-one breakfast station uh, is, is just, just terrific. It's, it's amazing. And then this set of knives from Deglon um, that sort of nest all in a beautiful flat block. Um, the interesting thing, though, is that while we all say innovation is one of our top strategic priorities, very few, only 34%, actually have an action plan for it. It's very easy to lose sight of that and to say, oh, we're open for new ideas rather than just planning new ideas, which is what's really important. Um, the other interesting part of this whole surprise business is the idea of subscriptions. Um, right now, uh, and it's not just a direct-to-consumer opportunity, which is terrific, but the... Um, Global subscription commerce is now 18% of the market. I don't know if any of you have any of these, uh, any of these Crate Joy or BarkBox or um, this uh, The Honest Company, but it's a really wonderful thing. You know, when you look at what, why the, um, why people subscribe to them, and what the business ethic is behind it. Uh, you know, whether you're subscribing for curation, you just want great cosmetic ideas or gift ideas or stationary ideas or food ideas. Um, subscriptions are a terrific opportunity for growth. Um, also, shareability. We're, we're hearing a lot about shareability again, but it's very different from what we've heard in the past. Before, when we listened to stories about something being shareable, we would look at online sharing. So you're making something and you're posting it uh, to Instagram or to Facebook and you're showing other people what you're doing and uh, or what your dog's doing or all of this. And while that is still incredibly important, we're seeing a a re-emergence, especially post-COVID-19, of this shareable that's based on physical experiences. Um, I'm going to jump past this. So there's physical sharing, which is in-person sharing, and we're all kind of like striving and wanting to get back to that again. We, you know, we'll, we'll be presenting in another IHA pre presentation shortly uh, more data on how people will be entertaining again and what we can expect of that. But this idea of physical sharing and IRL in real life experiences versus just things that you post has, is getting a lot of traction and we expect uh, the pandemic to really move that forward. I can't tell you how, how, is, how important simplicity is. Um, a lot of the businesses that we really see moving forward quickly are businesses that either focus on a very narrow assortment of great products, um, such as Warby Parker, uh, or they create a service that helps people to um, helps people to engage with them more easily, to try their product more readily without expense or initial outlay, um, and uh, you know, or to help them conquer a problem that is a sort of one solution, like Mobley, who does rental furniture, um, but they they you know, it's just like quick drop. 
uh, you know, cases, it's really making a life that's complex simple. But simplicity is something that we all aspire to. <clears throat> the connections, let's take a look at. Um, and there's a lot of data that that holds this up. Um, Siegel and Gale's uh, Global Brand Simplicity Index. We've got a link to it here, but. You know, what, one of the things that we see every single year is that the percentage of consumers that are going to pay more for something that's simple or simplifies their life is very high, uh, 55%. And also, consumers are loyal to companies that keep things simple for them. Um, it's, a, it's a great report. I, uh, if you get the chance, read it. 94% of consumers say that easy navigation is important, is the most important website feature. So even on our, uh, our web address of communities, simplicity is very important. 50% say they'll leave a website permanently if the content is not relevant to them. So it's important to stay re relevant and, and go up relevant every time because you may not have a chance to speak to these people again. 67% of people think websites with links to the company's social media account are extremely or somewhat useful. And that's important because you get to see what people are, are the feedback that people are giving this company. Um, one interesting thing that we've, that we've seen is that when consumers comparison shop, they comparison shop and actually look for negative reviews. Positive reviews, positive reviews, are positive reviews. But what they're looking for is the problems that negative reviews reveal. It's a very interesting statistic, and you'll see some on that later. Um, be trustworthy, be transparent, and be true. So consumer trust is really at an all-time low. Um, only 57% of consumers trust non-government institutions. Only 48% trust government. Only 48% trust business. And only 47% trust media. Um, trust for opinions and experiences expressed by other consumers, however, is at an all-time high. It's over 95% of consumers trust what other consumers say about a product. So that's why it's very important to engage in social media to make sure that you garner opinions from people who have used your products or have shopped your stores or understand your brand so that you can make sure that you pass that information on. Um, some interesting uh, examples of, <laughs> of transparency. So. Um, this picture on the upper right is, is fascinating to me. I don't know how many of you have seen it. It's absolutely disgusting, but it's a Burger King ad. Um, and they're talking about, uh, they're advertising the beauty of, of decay in that you, they are committed to a no preservative menu. So they, the, they show this by look at our burger next to their burger and our, our burger is moldy because it's, there's nothing in it to stop it from doing that. Um, you know, we also look at companies like Buffy, who have created, um, you know, a very sort of single source, um, eucalyptus based product blankets and things like that. Um, but again, very focused and then Hershey's trace it back, you can go on their site and see where your candy bar came from, you know, what it, how it, how it was transported, really what the footprint of it was and what it, you know, before you make your decision to buy. Um, and I know transparency is, you know, sort of, it's a very vague term to some people, so we wanted to clarify that, but consumers generally tend to define transparency along the lines of openness, clarity, and honesty. So admitting mistakes, 61% of consumers say that um, when a brand admits their mistakes, that's, that defines transparency. Honest responses to customer questions, product service and pricing, and manufacturing practice. So you can see this, and there's another great uh, article behind this as well. Uh, and be true. When we talk about being true, really we're talking about company culture. So you're true to the community you serve, you're true to your employees. Um, it, you know, culture really influences whether employees stay or leave and it establishes this set of norms that govern a workplace and that give it efficiency and a sort of a, an even playing field. Also, it really now, because there's so much transparency, being true and having a great company culture has become very transparent to the world at large. Um, so if people know if your employees love you or if they don't love you. Um, America's best large employees. We just wanted to put this out there to show you um, the top 10 employees. Now this was in 2017 because it was the last time that Forbes and Statista partnered up on this, but there hasn't been a tremendous amount of change in here, except there's been uh, you know, a rise of a couple of people. But you can see what people, and again, you can click into it and it'll, it'll tell you why they were rated so high by their employees. Um, but Thrive Global, um, uh, uh, Ariana Huffington's site, uh, put up a really great um, 
voting of, it was a survey of what people think make great leaders, emotionally intelligent, innovative, and great communicators, great followers, and exceedingly self-aware. Um, I love this uh, quote by Phil Libin from Evernote. Uh, he said, the product, the product is the current product, but the culture is the next hundred products. Um, and then I put in Amazon's culture of innovation because I think it's really, really impressive um, that, that it starts with customer obsession. Consumer-centric development, consumer-centric is the, it, it's, it's the new mantra. We are all about the consumer, no matter what size you are or where you are, you're about the consumer and you're about the individual and bringing them the best product and process and, um, and experience that you possibly can. And then finally, we look at um, be real world, be responsible and be reactive. So when we talk about being real world, it's we want to face up to what the real world is and stop trying to convince ourselves that people don't do brick and mortar because, you know, uh, Everybody sort of convinces themselves why people shop online and why, you know, uh, and what the reasons are. So we decided to really go in and, and look at reliable reportings about why people shop online. So the ability to shop 24 seven, the ability to compare prices online sale and better prices to save time. These are all things that brick and mortar can achieve relatively well as well. So it's important to understand that it's also a part of our job to make sure that if we want brick and mortar to survive, we need to make sure that people understand that this can be accomplished at brick and mortar as well. We're getting, uh, we're getting, we're getting there on that. Um, top reasons consumer love, brand, love brands. They make life more comfortable, convenient, and entertaining. Fulfills my internal vision of myself. It evokes positive feelings and it helps them be understood as a consumer and a person. Um, it's important when we talk about brands to understand that brands are not just defined by, um, you know, Nike or, or Prada or any of, they're not just names. You are a brand. You live your brand every day. So you create many, many companies of every size, small, medium, large, have all created themselves as brands. Um, and the more we get into curated assortments, the more that we see that you're creating your own brand every time somebody walks into your store. Um, now brands are more on a local level in many cases and small, smaller local businesses have the ability to create a brand inside their community of themselves. Um, being responsible. There's plenty to say about environmental responsibility. We'll be talking about that more as the year goes by. But again, just looking here at what consumers want out of those products. So um, when we think about corporate sustainability, Providing certified goods and services is number one. Creating local jobs is number two. Not something that we would normally associate with with sustain with environment with responsibility, but responsibility is about environmental responsibility, social responsibility, cultural responsibility. So there are a lot of different things that roll into that, and all of them are very highly valued by the consumers. You can see here, um, and then you know here again some other products that speak to that, and there are articles attached to those. The, um, I thought this was really interesting. Uh, this was a, a 2018 survey, uh, but, but I, I think that we can only say that it's probably gotten more intense since then. Um, this was the percentage of people who agreed that they would pay more for eco-friendly products. 58% of Gen Z, 61% of millennials, 55% of Gen X, and 46% of baby boomers. So, you know, I think we all know that, you know, the, where the rubber meets the road is probably a lower percentage because there are a lot of other factors that play into that. But if we can create products where, you know, where the prices are commensurate and you've got, you know, other, all other things being equal, it's, it's definitely a benefit to be, be responsible. And also we're, we're starting to see a lot of um, corporate social responsibility, you know, and, and where people expect it. Now people are expecting that uh, it, at food retailers, 70% of people want it at food retailers. Um, in travel, uh, also 52%. You know, and you can look at the Clutch survey. One of the things that we really liked was there are some brands that, um, that are really sort of stepping up in terms of uh, making charitable contributions. But one of the more, most interesting ones on the right here is a company called Tis Best. So you give a gift certificate to someone, but it is for a dollar amount and you get to choose the charity that it goes to. Uh, so it's, it's really, it's giving you the ability to support um, the, you know, the charity of your choice. There's literally tens of thousands of charities listed under Tis Best, and you're just giving them the ability to give to that charity. 
Um, being reactive. So, you know, I mean, we talk a lot about being proactive, but it's super important that companies and brands stay reactive. They look at their reviews constantly and respond to them. Um, so, you know, consumers are really taking control through these reviews. They know the power of them. They are expressing themselves through the view, reviews that they give um, and also through the bloggers that they listen to. Now, 97% of consumers consult product reviews while 85% seek out negative reviews before they make a purchase. Um, and that's from uh, Power. So that's where we are with Faster. Um, as I said, the, the final presentation has a lot more data in it, but I wanted to sort of give you a, I know it just probably doesn't seem like that was a short version, uh, but um, just to wrap it up, just remember that what's driving consumer demand has really changed. It's changed from demographics where we look at age and incomes and things like that to psychographics where we really look at people's interests, their passions, the way that they live. Um, we've moved from caring about me and my family to adding in caring about society, caring about the planet. We've moved from delivering product, driving consumer demand to delivering shareable experiences or delivering experiences, personal experiences, but experience is the new commodity. Um, We've moved from a focus on the life that the consumer is living today to the person that the consumer wants to be. Um, like we said about the flu itself, people want to recreate themselves constantly, um, both for social reasons and for sharing reasons, but also to explore what they can be. Um, and that re being a part of that reinvention is the best road to brand success. We used to have something where retailers and big brands really dominated the landscape, but now it's shopping whenever and whoever we want. Uh, as long as we can find them, as long as they're visible. So visibility plays a very important role in success. And it used to be about brand size. How big is the brand? You know, and, and that the bigger the brand, the more it drives consumer demand. Now it's about how relevant the brand is, regardless of size and whether or not that, you know, that can keep consumers. We've moved from an era of industrial consumption or an industrial era of consumption to a digital era of consumers. And again, focusing on the consumer, the life that they live, how we can solve their problems, how we can give them more time, more space, um, and all of those intangibles that we talked about. And that is uh, where we are. So uh, as I said, I'll, I'll share all of this with you and I'll give you all copies of it and things, but Leanna, you back from coffee? <laughs> Oop, your mic's off. That had to happen. Um, so thank you so much, Tom. That was really great stuff. So a couple um, questions that have popped up here, um, probably no surprise, right? Within the course of the presentation, you've got mm. five different letters and roughly three different, you know, points per. So you got a lot of different, a lot of different ways you can go here, a lot of different areas you can focus on. Any yeah. thoughts um, on how to start to prioritize, how to think about where to start in all of these different <laughs> The biggest thing, it's, it sounds super simple, but you'd be surprised how many people don't do it. Um, the biggest thing is really to ask yourself two questions. First, what customer do I have? What customer do I have today? Um, and what customer do I want? Because a lot of times we, we get very, you know, you, and this happens big business and small business. We go down the street, like the main street in our town, or we, we um, sometimes you walk into a retailer and you're like, they're just this far off, they're tr they seem desperate, they're trying everything, as opposed to being focused and having a point of view and saying, this is who we are, this is what we believe. I think it really, focus first on who do we want to attract? Because once you, once you know that, it tells you what social media you should be paying attention to, it tells you, because, and we've got, we're gonna be, uh, Leanna and I are working on a, on a market watch report that we're gonna be delivering a week from today. And it's gonna tell you exactly how much time people spend on different types of social media, what their age is, you know. Uh, and when, so when you have a clear understanding of who your consumer is or who you wanna attract, mm -hmm. then you know how to communicate with them, what kind of assortments you should be really putting forward. You even know what, what sites they're interested in. Where do, they, where do they look for inspiration? What blogs do they follow? What's, what influencers do they follow? And, and so defining who you, who you are and who you want to be and what the difference is between those two is really, to me, a first step. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I wonder if, um, you know, you mentioned you had one data point, you know, towards the end here on um, responsibility and about, mm -hmm. you know, how the different generations um, are, you know, different percentages of them are willing to pay more for an eco-friendly product. 
Yeah. Have you seen any of that in other, have you, do you see other generational divides um, that really jump out at you across these 15 different areas where, you know, mm. one generation is really prone to embrace something versus, you know, maybe not the others? Yeah. You know, I mean, I think, I think a lot of it is very intuitive and very logical. Like, for example, one of the things that you and I were talking about, and again, it's going to be in the Market Watch report a week from now, is wellness, health and wellness. So when you look at health and wellness, very important to know who your customer is, okay? So, and, and you can do a lot of research about who does CBD really appeal to, because now it's like, well, everybody's got a CBD thing, you know, but that may not be appropriate for you. You know, here in Brooklyn, where CBD is biggest, believe it or not, it's pet stores. People are like, you know, my, you know, my dog is like neurotic and blah, blah, blah. But, but, a, but in terms of generations, health and wellness, when you look at um, Gen Z and millennials are very proactive and they, they do what we call offsetting. So in other words, they will, they will gorge on like three brownies because, but they're, they know exactly what their metabolism is. They've been working out. They can offset that with physical activity. Um, Gen Xers and boomers are a little bit more reactive. We're trying to, we're trying to fix what we screwed up already. Okay. Like we're trying to get our blood pressure back down. We're trying to sleep more because we know it's important for us. So it's, it's important to understand that proactive and reactive, like how is your consumer about also what are their attitudes towards time? Very, very important differentiator. Um, boomers are about quality leisure time. So a lot, and a lot of that can be at home, you know, whereas millennials are about quality social time which is experience. It's all about experience and whether that experience is digital or not, you know, so there, those are two areas where they really, there's a lot of divergence. And again, we'll be talking about the generations a little right. bit more, but, uh, but it's, you know, really those are the big ones. Just think about the way people spend their time and the way they live and imagine what your consumer's doing right now. What do they do with their evenings? It's a great job actually to like, sometimes we had, we had exercises where we'd talk to people's staffs and say, okay, um, I'll never forget, great example, Walmart. We were at a Walmart meeting, we had a bunch of people at the table, and I hope I'm not telling tales out of school, and I said, just show of hands, how many, there were probably 18 buyers and, and people at the table. I said, how many people um, have dinner at the table with their family? And one person raised your hand, just like, and I mean, it's really surprising, you know? But I never would have guessed it, but yeah. once I asked it, it educated a lot of the decisions that I made. Mm -hmm. No, so that's interesting. So it's it's less, you know, you know, of course we've talked about these types of things before, but it's less about, you know, that this one attribute appeals to one generation versus another. It's that each one of those attributes might mean something slightly different to whatever generation yeah. you're serving. Yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah. But understand that it, millennials have had such tremendous influence that their their influence is spreading across generations. Mm -hmm. Um we, for example, work-life balance. Okay, we said it started with Gen X, but now everybody's about work-life balance. Anybody who's working is like, you know what? The door closes, my day's over, I have the rest of my life to live, and unless you're gonna pay for it, you're gonna get my time. You know, so that it's, we're all about, it, people are very, and honestly, COVID-19 COVID has made that, we, we're re-engaging with our families and we're saying how important that is. You know, I mean, yes, you wanna kill them sometimes, but uh, you know, the whole idea of just, we're, we've re-engaged with, communication, board games, puzzles, all of these things, you know, it's, it's just, um, so yes, it is in the context, but it, don't forget that even though those walls of age and experience are up, the, we're all, we're adapters. We're very open to hearing new ideas and saying, you know what, they're right. Why am I doing it this way? Yeah. And, you know, speaking of COVID-19, so certainly that's come up in the questions as well, you know, saying, is there anything that, you know, in your, in your, you know, point of view, and, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the webinar that you're going to do with us next Thursday, which is more about kind of, you know, forward looking into the, you know, the consumer of the, of the future. Um, but with the, the pandemic here and with people realigning kind of their needs and, you know, their desires and their priorities, is there anything that you see, you know, really, really, any of these points that are really going to pick up in the next, you know, year or so and any that are maybe going to be on the downturn? Um, I think that, I think that we can, I think it's a tremendous opportunity for, it's a tremendous opportunity for smaller retailers to re-engage. We see people, we see our friends and our friends of friends um, going out of business, you know, and, and we see them being challenged and we're going to help the small people first. So it's important to, you know, I don't want to say be small or look at, but if you don't, if you're not small, you have to show the, the, 
sensitivity and the service level that a small smaller retailer can exhibit because uh, honestly in my opinion independents are going to come out of this thing swinging and they're really going to be, we're, we're doing a, a, a webinar with a, a group next week that's just about how can I serve better? How can we, how can we serve, uh, you know, consumers better and, and our accounts? And that's, so I, I think that that's, that's a part of it. But also for home and housewares, you know, you look at what happened last week. So we had, um, we had uh, Google say that their employees didn't have to come back to work uh, for the rest of the year and that they were probably going to just, uh, you know, uh, keep keep working from home you had uh the uh facebook i think it was said that they don't have to that they're going to be working at home through the end of 2020 so you know that the ripple effects of something like that first you can count on the fact that you're going to need that now other employers are going to say well if i don't give people that option then what am i saying am i still a good employer so that's going to push others to do that that means you're going to be needing more products in uh you're going to be needing more products that are home office. We're going to need to create more transformative spaces. We're going to be more sensitive about space in general, which you and I were talking about. But also, in terms of home and housework, what, what did we see in 2008? In the 2008 recession, when people started having to make food at home because they couldn't eat out as often, really difficult for the restaurant industry. But, mm-hmm. for, but people were spending more on cookware and, and housewares than they ever had because they were like, if I have to do it, I'm going to do it with some product that's good. <laughs> I'm going to do it with some, I'm going to treat myself to something nice if I have to do it. And I think that that, you know, that, um, that st- still bears out. Yeah, the, the data is definitely um, bearing, you know, fruit in that way. The last several, last couple of months, I mean, the, the sales of home and houseware products are really um, doing incredibly well, you know, I mean, over and above what they were doing this time last year, during a time when many others are, um, you know, are falling off and that, that people, you know, people are in a nesting mode, right? You know, people are, I, mean, I, I currently am trying to figure out how to, how can have, how does my home accommodate, you know, work plus, you know, my kids and, you know, my family mm-hmm. and everything else. And how do I pull off all those different things in one space without feeling trapped, you know? And so mm-hmm. you have to create different spaces and different environments. So I think that'll be really very interesting moving forward. Also, you've got the the ethic now for even for big businesses, don't, don't tell me you understand me, tell me you are me, show me that you are me. And that's really important because it really puts the onus back on all of us to don't, don't, don't put your own life out of this. Think about exactly what you're saying. You just said it. We all have to think like that. So what am I doing? What's aggravating me? Because things have gotten very personal and we're realizing by talking that there, we all want to put our husbands in the barn for a while. You know, it's like, it's, we're, we all share these experiences. There's a lot, you know, so I think that it's, you know, it's, it's very humanizing, but that means solving real problems, you yeah. know, and, and really basic stuff sometimes. Yeah, well, I hope that your um, I hope your thoughts about the independent retailers are right on because there's nothing I would hate more than to see you know some of these wonderful you know independent retail shops um, you know have to close down. Over we have there. to support them. So, yeah, you know, I, yeah, you know and, and certainly my hope is that as we as we start to emerge from our houses and start to reengage in society. And to your point, you know, there's a there's a piece of the home you know related to more people working at home, but there's also that need for social interaction, right, and for engagement. Yeah. People. And mm-hmm. I do wonder if you could see a resurgence in, you know, once people feel comfortable enough to go out and go to the store on a regular basis, you know, just that need to have human contact and interaction. Well, yeah, we so will. More, more of your life is, is in your house. We definitely will. I think, but what you'll see is you'll see, I think there are going to be more smaller gatherings. You know, uh, I, it's going to be interesting to see what happens with, you know, Halloween and things. I think we're going to be a little, playing a little bit closer to home, you know, uh, and we're going to have, more frequent gatherings with with a smaller number of people, uh, you know. So, kind of where my head's at. Yeah. All right. Well, we are out of questions here, so we can go ahead and wrap up. Tom, thank you so much. I do want to quickly point out for everybody a um, couple things. First of all, as Tom mentioned, we're going to make the presentation. A recording of this webinar will be available. A copy of the presentation will be available. Um, and I will go ahead and get an email out, a follow-up email to everyone who registered for this webinar to make sure you know where to locate those things. And then the other thing I want to make sure everyone's aware of is next Thursday's webinar, which Tom will be back with us um, doing what has traditionally been his uh, 
Inspired Home Show keynote address on the modern consumer. And this one in particular is really exciting to me because it's around data points for how the way we consumers live is going to evolve over the next 10 years and way that um, retailers and product manufacturers can start to think about how that's going to, you know, how should that shape their innovation, you know, in the next few years. As really, they really, really interesting. It's, it's, yeah, it's between, it's, it's a view of now to 2030, which is closer than any of us think. Right. And just, it's taking each generation and saying, okay, if we look, this is where they are today and this is what they live like today. Yeah. In five years, they're going to be here. In 10 years, they're going to be here. How are you going to change your assortment to start developing for that? So yeah, very, very really good stuff. So um, again, I'll include a, a note on how to register for that in the follow-up email here. And then um, there will also be links to it, of course, on um, housewares.org and on the inspiredhomeshow.com. Com. So thank you everyone for participating, Tom. Thanks a million and yeah, always good stuff. Pleasure. Um, everybody, have a great week. All right, have a good one. Thank you. Bye-bye.